moderator of our 5C module is a founder of ELK Academy, an international company that teaches languages, communication, and skills of the future to professionals around the world. Among his students are celebrity founders like ABBYS's David Yang, companies like Miro and Avito, venture capitalists and startups alike. Fedor Sokolov is also a leader in the skills and practice department in the Go Global community and a minister of education in Mesto. Inspired by global best educators and his own learning by doing approach, he formulated the ELK concept, that is, education plus love equals knowledge. For this module, Fedor has brought together inspiring specialists with diverse backgrounds, all of which are united by a love for creating this new approach to education. I'm delighted to hand over to Fedor. Hello, I'm honored to welcome you to this module, Five C's Skills of the Digital Age. While building this module with our speakers, my main goal was to make sure that you will get specific and practical tools and strategies that you can apply straight away, not only at work in your companies, but also in your personal life with your loved ones. <laughs> I mean, it's not that you have to go too far these days between those two, right? My name is Fyodor Sokolov and I've been an educator for more than 18 years now. My company, Elk Academy, teaches languages, communication, and most importantly, skills of the future to professionals worldwide. I know exactly how crucial these new skills have become, yet how tricky it is to find actual strategies that show measurable and specific results when developing soft skills. Each speaker in this module will focus on one of the skills of the future, communication, collaboration, creative thinking, critical thinking, and the one that we at ELK added to the initial four C's formula, compassion. Without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our first speaker on the first C, communication. He is a body language expert and has written 18 bestsellers, including 10 number ones and given seminars in 70 countries. His books are translated into 55 languages and have sold over 27 million copies. Alan Peace will share some incredibly insightful tips on communicating effectively in these socially distant times. Also, Alan will help you to bring your digital communication skills to a new level. So, the world's changing. What we used to know doesn't exist much anymore. And with what we're doing today with business and dealing with people, how far into the future is that likely to go? Well, when you look at the four C's of success, You've got creativity, critical thinking, communication, and cooperation. Two of those involve thinking, that is creativity and critical thinking. The other two involve human beings, that is cooperation and communication. So what are the most important ones? In fact, what is the most important one of those four? Well, two that involve thinking are not as important because they're important, but not as important because Computers, robots, artificial intelligence will do those for you either now or in the future. There's one thing that hasn't changed with human beings, and it's been there for thousands of years. And for as long as we're human beings as a species, it's going to be there. And that is the ability to communicate one-on-one -on -one or one-on-a-group with other people. So how good are you at doing that? You know, in the age of this pandemic, most people are rotten at it. They're not much good at it at all. So what can we do now to be able to convince, persuade, motivate people to get them on side? And how will this pan out in the future? Well, one thing is true. The bottom line with all business, it's about people. And the bottom line is if people buy you, that is they feel comfortable with you, they feel relaxed, they feel as though you understand them, you identify with them. If they buy you, there's a pretty good chance they'll buy what goes with you. Now, the reverse is also true. If somebody doesn't buy you, that is, there's something about you that they, they don't quite connect with. Maybe they don't like something. They can't even tell you what it is. There's just something about you that doesn't gel with them. Then they're looking for reasons not to buy you or anything that you've got to say. 
Whereas if they buy you, even if what you're saying isn't maybe the world's greatest thing, they'll look for reasons to say yes, because we want to give our love, our business, our time, our money, our yeses to people that we like. You see, when you have a dinner party where you want to have a fun night, you don't invite the people who know the most. Who do you invite? You invite people who are the most fun, those you identify with, those you feel that there's a connection. So if people have a connection with you, if they feel that, then they're likely to persuade themselves to give you a yes. That's what we're going to talk about now, communication. So why is this so important? Well, 60 to 80% of all the impact that you make in a face-to-face -face encounter, and right now for most of us we're face-to-face -face on a screen, 60 to 80% of that impact is done non-verbally, that is with things other than words, gestures, movements, expressions, uh, facial gestures, distance, how far you in, how far you are back, uh, the angle of your body, and so on. 60 to 80% of impact is done that way. And people will form up to 90% of their impression about you in under four minutes. Now that's whether it's on a Zoom call on a screen like this, or whether it's face to face. They form up to 90% of their impression in under four minutes. That's why some of the worst advice you can give someone is just be yourself. They need to be their best self, their practice self, their rehearsed self. So when they make that first four minutes where they're meeting new people, whether it's on, on a screen or face to face, they're making the best possible impression to give themselves the greatest chance for a person to feel sufficiently relaxed to want to give them a hearing and maybe say yes to what they want. Okay, well, what happens then when you meet people and you can't shake their hand. So we've had several thousand years of putting a hand out and shaking hands with people that we meet. Now, most countries in the world have used handshaking. Now, Asian countries might use bowing or body lowering or some other type of body touching or a why in a greeting. But most cultures in the world, the business handshake has been the opening of most new meetings. Now, we generally don't do that now because it can kill you. Because of germ transfer, We've generally stopped doing it. Governments have told us to stop doing it. And you know something interesting? Studies with handshaking have shown that a lot of people never liked handshaking, and most of those are women. They prefer not to shake hands, not only because of the germ transmission, but because they feel awkward, because chances are your hand might be bigger than hers, uh, and there might be a power struggle taking place. And power struggle, in fact, is the origin of modern handshaking. It goes back to the era over 2,000 years ago in Rome where leaders would meet after the fighting or the training and those leaders were almost always men. And when they'd meet, they'd go into like an arm resting type position, sitting at a table or crouching on the ground. And they look each other in the eye and they apply pressure. Now the person with the most amount of pressure would have what was called the upper hand, that is the hands on top. This was important in the Roman era because if I have the upper hand, it means that my soldiers have the first go at the, have the first attempt to have the food, the wine, the dancing, and so on. And your people, your troops, have to wait their turn. So it was always important to have the upper hand. And now today, that translates into a handshake because we do it standing. So when you meet someone, even though uh, we're not necessarily Roman soldiers anymore, but if my hand is slightly on top of yours when we shake, you'll get a feeling at a gut level that I'm exerting pressure on you. You're probably not even aware of it. Now, with the pandemic and with germ transmission, handshaking's at least temporarily gone. I believe it'll come back in the long term, but right now it's off the table. So how do you meet someone without going through that awkwardness? Because it's awkward, isn't it? You meet someone and they're not sure what to do, and so maybe they start to put their hand out to you to shake hands because they're not sure what to do. You see their hand coming and you recoil in horror. Not a good start for any face-to-face -face meeting. People don't buy you when you do that. So what I'm going to give you now is a very simple, very powerful, very effective greeting signal. It has three parts. Here's the first part. When you meet someone, don't put your hand out. If you see their hand coming, you stop them, and I'll show you in a moment how to do that. First part is put your hand over your heart. That's the first part. This is called the heart hello. Now, hand on heart has been used for thousands of years to show sincerity, loyalty, truth, honesty, uh, that we are supporting a cause. So most people understand the significance of hand on heart. That's the first part. The second part of the heart hello is you just lean forward slightly, but keep your eyes up. It's not like a Japanese bow where the eyes are looking down. You lean forward slightly with the eyes up, so you're maintaining that contact. The body language contact now is through the eyes. That's the second part. 
Now, leaning forward is very significant because the limbic system of the brain, that is the ancient part of the brain, understands that when another person makes themselves lower than you, that they're not being aggressive. So in that first meeting, you don't want to be aggressive. Hand on heart, leaning forward, keeping the eyes up. Now, you don't want to drop your eyes because dropping your eyes is a sign of submission to that other person, which you probably don't want to be submissive. You want to at least be on an equal footing. An equal footing means you're, that your eyes are sitting at roughly the same level. So you keep your eyes looking up, and the next part is your smile, with your teeth visible. Now, this is important. When you smile, they must be able to see your teeth because if they don't see your teeth, they're going to be suspicious on a very deep level. And there's an interesting reason why this is the case. Now, as humans, we're the only land animal that bears its teeth that doesn't bite next. In fact, for humans, it's a submission signal. So if you and I meet and I say hello, and I use this smile, and I'm over-exaggerating it now, but I use the smile to show my teeth, you will think to yourself, Alan is not aggressive. And that's what I want. That's why I smile. My grandmother taught me when I was a small child, always smile when you meet people. And she didn't have any brain scanners or x-ray imaging to work out why this works so well. She just knew if I did that, I'd be accepted and I would be likely to get the job that I might be applying for or get the person to like me or give me some sweets. So showing the teeth is important for humans. Why? Well, think of this. Think of other animal species. Let's talk about dogs or lions. If a dog smiles at you, what happens next? Well, you're going to get bitten. He's going to attack you because the dogs show their teeth. In fact, animals that attack other animals show their teeth as a warning signal because they're pointed, sharp teeth that rip other animals apart. And that's why, as a human, it's a submission signal when we do it. Because why? Look, fruit choppers, nut-grinding teeth. We have herbivore, vegetarian teeth. They're non-threatening. So when we show them, and I'm overacting to make the point, I mean, if you did it like that in real life, they'd probably think you're a bit, bit loopy. But when I show you my teeth when I smile, your ancient brain, the limbic system, says to you, this person, that's me, is not aggressive, won't bite me, won't attack me. And that's why it's so important, whether you meet someone on a screen or in real life, that you show your teeth and smile. Even if you're having a bad day, by showing your teeth and smiling, it will affect that other person positively. They'll say to themselves, you're not aggressive, uh, I can like you, which is what you want. That's the start. So the heart alone has three parts, hand on heart, Leaning forward, eyes, maintaining eye contact, and showing your teeth. Here's how it would look. Hello, nice to meet you. So, so what happens when you meet someone and their hand comes forward, but you don't want to shake hands? Well, simple. This gives you a great opportunity. Say to them, uh, now we won't shake hands, copy me. Watch this, do this, put your hand on your heart, explain what I just explained, the hand on heart. Lean forward slightly with your eyes up and smile. And you give them a brief training session. This has the effect of bonding you to a person very quickly because they think, well, I've just learned something from you. Not only that, clearly you're an easygoing, friendly sort of person who's interested in making sure that this encounter we have face-to-face -face gets off at a good start on the right foot. So nice to meet you. And when you leave, nice to have done business with you exactly the same way, maintaining the eye contact at all times. This is called the heart hello. And you'll see this with politicians on television. Uh, these are now doing this. You'll see them doing it because it creates that right that right balance of friendliness uh, without any germ transmission. That's the important part here. Well, by teaching other people to do it as well when you meet them, they, they kind of like this. They think, well, you just taught me something. And you teach them to teach it to other people. So rather than starting off in that first four minutes where we're forming up tonight, you've presented their impression, rather than being awkward, which it is, let's face it, it's awkward for most of it. We don't know what we should or shouldn't be doing. By doing this and practicing it and teaching people you meet to do it as well, face to face, it creates a non-threatening, warm impression and people feel very positive about buying you. And remember, if they buy you, there's a good chance to buy what goes with you. Now, the other place you're likely to be meeting people now is, is on the screen, on a computer screen or on a telephone. Now, video calls currently have become the big thing because 70% of people in most countries are now stuck at home. They're working from home. And in the future... Uh, it may not be as much as 70%, but the Zoom type video calls are here to stay. We have now worked out that we can all do this because we know how to do it and we are doing it successfully. So this will be a part of our future. However, it will go back to the old times of greeting people with maybe with handshakes or with heart hellos. 
uh, being face to face because, look, you can listen to a record and love listening to the music, but we still want to go to a concert and see the live performer sing. And that'll come back when the time is right. Okay, well, what do you do when you've got someone on a screen? Well, if you watch television where they're interviewing famous people or politicians are trying to make their point, most of these people are terrible. They're shocking. They really don't know what to do. So what should you do on a screen? Rule number one, the background. What's behind you? If you're on a screen, you want to convince, persuade, motivate, get a person on side. And look, that's the reason you're there, right? You want to bond, get them to say yes, the same as if you've been face to face, except now they're on a screen. What's behind you? Most people don't think about it. The other day, I had a, a Skype call with a gentleman wearing a suit and tie. He was in England. And he was talking very, very professionally to me because he was an associate professor. And behind him, a door opened. It was a toilet door. And a young boy walked out with his pants down around his ankle and walked past with a toilet roll holding in his hand. Now, I burst into laughter. And the fellow on the screen had no idea what I was laughing at. I explained what it was. And, and luckily, it was OK. I saved the day. And he felt OK, a little bit embarrassed. But most people don't know what's behind them. So what can you put behind you? Well, for $100 or less, in US dollars, you can buy a green screen. Just set it up behind you. It's portable with a couple of lights. It's very simple, very straightforward. You can drop in your own background. That's the first thing you can do. Uh, you can get a real background. So if you've got a, so a wonderful setting on the outdoors, a wonderful setting in your home, a wonderful setting in your office, uh, you can use that as a background. But look behind you to see what does the background say about you? Now, many people, you'll see them on television, are using a library behind them. So the library, full of books, implies wisdom, even though under 40s don't read books anymore, but it implies some form of wisdom. If you haven't got a library or haven't got a good background, just get a small green screen, put it behind you, and you can drop in your own image if you're going to have make a video. It's very simple, easy to do. Now, what do you sound like? Most people don't think about sound. You see so many people on television, highly credible people, wearing two ear pods on their, on their ears, two ear pods. And it looks terrible. They look like something out of Star Wars. Now, on the net, for around about 50 to 60 dollars, you can buy one of these little microphones. Very simple. We'll plug into your, your five, four or five K camera. We'll plug into whatever you're using to record. Very simple, very easy, and it brings the sound level up. Now, for about 50 to 80 dollars, you can buy one of these. Well, for around 200 dollars US, you can get what I've got now, which is a wireless one, which has a, a distance of around 50 meters that you can wander around and talk. It makes you sound professional. Background makes you look professional. What does your face look like? Well, most people don't think about this. Now, remember, on a screen, it's only that big. You're probably zooming on the person's face and the upper part of their body. So, what does their face look like? Uh, if you're wearing makeup, is your makeup right? Does it match the scene? Uh, have you not had a shave? You see, many people think because we're on Zoom, it's somehow informal. It's not. It's professional. It's business. You need to get control of this, otherwise you'll look like a clown. So what should you do? Well, if, if you're a shaver, which I am, make sure you're shaved. Make sure if you've got a shiny, sweaty face, which I do occasionally, particularly under hot lights, that you put on some type of a, a powder or makeup. To make the, it makes all that, that amateurishness go away and you look like, at least you care enough to have spent the time to make sure that you look like that you are the credible person you are. So how do you need to dress for a Skype call, for a Zoom call? Well, the answer is very simple. See, if we're casting a character into a movie, well, they might be the good guy, they might be the bad guy, they might be whatever their character is. We dress them a specific way so they look like the stereotype person that matches that occupation. So do you look like you have the credibility and authority to match the occupation you've got, to put yourself in a position that people will buy you and give you the opportunity to ask for a yes, to close the sale, to ask for the business, to ask for money, to ask for cooperation, to ask them to join? Do you look like you have the credibility? And with most Zoom calls and Skype calls, most people don't. Now, if you don't look like you have the, if you haven't dressed for the interview, that means you've got to work three times, four times as hard to overcome people's preconceived judgments about who you are and what your credibility level is. So, for example, uh, if you were in the legal profession or insurance or finance, 
you might expect if a person's giving you advice and is going to ask you to contribute money or get you to say yes, they've probably got some sort of suit on. If they're older, they might have a shirt and tie on. Uh, if it's a man, he's probably clean face. If it's a woman, she's got neutral makeup, not long earrings, but short earrings. That's probably what you'd expect. So when someone appears on the screen and looks like that, your ancient brain says, well, this person looks like they know what they're talking about. Now, if they didn't look like that, if it was a man who got on there, hadn't shaved for five days and had one earring in and had a toilet door swinging behind him, and he's trying to convince you to give them money to say yes, uh, to go along with what they're proposing, your brain is saying, tilt, tilt, tilt. You're judging what, why this person thinks they have the credibility to be saying these things. So does clothing make a difference? Absolutely. Does the way your face make a difference? Yes, it does. Okay, so what things can you do on a screen to convince, persuade people? Well, in real life, when you're face to face with people, if, if you like what, what you're hearing, you like what they're saying, if you like that person, what we do, we, we lean towards people and events that we like. Uh, conversely, we lean away from people and events that we don't like. Now with a screen, you can do this very, very well. That when you're going to listen to someone, just lean forward a little like that. And when You've heard enough, lean back. Now, once you've done that two or three times, the other person intuitively gets the feeling that when you've leant back, they've got to shut up. They've got to come to an end to allow you to talk. If you want to talk, you can do the reverse. Maybe you lean forward and talk. When you've stopped, you lean back. When you lean forward, you talk. When you stop, you lean back. So if they're talking, they know when you lean forward that they've got to wrap it up because you've got something to say. This way you don't interrupt each other, which is a common problem with Zoom calls and tele telephone calls. Not only does it mean that, uh, that you don't, you don't uh, cut them off, it also means that you're controlling the length of the conversations, which is what you want. You want to be in charge of what's happening. Now, what else can you do? Hands. When you've got yourself on the screen, just move your hands out to see how far do they go before they disappear off your recording device. So let's say, for example, in this case, I can move my hands within this frame here. We need to, to know how to do this because with the hands, if people can see your palms, the limbic brain kicks in and they get a feeling that you are more likely to be trustworthy. And the same applies to monkeys and chimpanzees, as it does with smiling. See, when a, if a monkey or an ape smiles at you, <laughs> they're being submissive because they have vegetarian teeth like we do, herbivore teeth. Whereas a dog or a tiger smiles at you, you're going to get attacked. It's an attack signal. But for vegetarian type animals, <laughs> like most primates, because we're, we're raised, born as vegetarians. We're eating meat uh, kind of like by accident more than by intent. And so if people see your palms, it affects the ancient brains just like it does with other primates because you can see that there's nothing held or concealed in my hands so therefore, you're more likely to trust and believe me. And studies that we did with body language, we wrote this in our body language book and course, show this very clearly, that if you talk with your palms visible, that people are more likely to accept you and go along with you. The moment your hands are out of sight and you're saying exactly the same thing, they're less likely to trust you and are more likely to be suspicious. So keep the palms up, but keep them back. You see, when you move your hand forward, your hand becomes bigger. It can make you look disproportionate. So if there are two of you on a Skype call, uh, as one leans forward to make a point, the other one must lean forward at the same time. So you lean back and forward together. Because if one leans forward and one leans back, it makes the other person look like they've got a little tiny head and you've got a great big head. So you keep the heads roughly the same size. Well, what about mirroring? Mirroring is something I love. Body language is nothing more than an outward reflection of your emotional condition. It shows how you're feeling. So whatever emotion you're feeling is likely to be reflected in gestures, movements and expressions. So for example, if I don't like what I see, hear, feel, or experience, I don't like the people I'm with, uh, I might cross my arms on my, on my chest like this. I might even cross my legs, perhaps like this. Now if you say to me, Alan, you look a bit defensive, I'll say, no, I'm not, I'm comfortable. Well, that's true, I am comfortable because I'm not happy. As long as you're all, all around here and I'm not comfortable, this will feel very good for me. If I'm with all my friends having a great time, this is not comfortable. This is comfortable when I'm with all my friends. Okay, so. As you're watching someone on the screen, if they start gesturing like this and, move the, and moving their hands like that, as you talk and respond, mirror, do the same thing. So the next person on the next screen, they make these movements and sit like that. As you talk to them, copy. Now, when you first start to do this mirroring technique, you feel a 
bit silly. You're saying to yourself, they know what I'm doing. No, they don't. All they know is when they look at you, there's something about you they like. And what they like is the fact that they see their own emotions reflected in you. That's why mirroring is such a powerful thing. Well, what happens then if you're down to the point where you're not on Zoom, you're sending text, SMS, email, where you've got print only? This is a pretty dangerous area because 60 to 80% of all emotions face-to-face -face is done non-verbally. When you get down to a telephone call, you've lost most of that. You only have vocal sounds, the way you sound, and words. When you get down to print and text, you only have text, which is the most misinterpreted medium. And you've probably all had the experience where uh, you've sent a text or an email or a, uh, a note to someone and you put a little line in there that you wanted it to be a humorous line, to be funny. And you put it in there and the other person misinterpreted it and thought you were being arrogant or rude. That's because they've interpreted your text based on their emotions, not based on yours. So if you're going to put in lines, particularly humorous lines, or any line that might have an emotion in it, use emojis. Now the good thing about emojis, they're free, they cost you nothing. There's about 12 basic emojis. So if you put a funny line into your text, just take a little smiling face and put that at the end. Now you can get software on the web now that you can make your own emojis with your own face. So you just photograph your own expressions and make your own emojis of yourself. So as people read your text, they can hear your voice coming out of the screen because if they don't know what emotion you meant in there, then they're likely to misinterpret it by interpreting it by their emotions. So use emojis. Now, women don't have a, have a problem with this. Women are very good at it. Men think, oh, it's a bit girly to use emojis. No, it's not. It's powerful. And a, a pers if a person can hear your voice and feel your emotions, they're more likely to buy you and say yes to what goes with you. And in terms of text, whatever you put in print, only write things the way you'd say it. Now, I got a letter this morning from someone in, in Northern Europe, and they said, Dear Professor Pease, uh, herewith enclosed for your perusal, now that's English from the late 1800s. If you spoke to somebody face to face like that, if you met me and said, oh dear Professor Pease, uh, further to our, our letter of the 10th inch, I mean, you wouldn't say that. I think that you, you'd lost it. So if you don't say something, don't put it in text. Don't put it in print. So what do you, how do you put it in print? Simple. Say things the way you would say it. If someone can hear your voice coming from the text, and with emojis, emojis they, <laughs> I spent a thousand dollars on my eyes, now my mouth's not working. With, with emojis, if they can see your emotions, you, your text, your emails, your letters will become entertaining and people will buy them. And if they buy them and buy you, there's a good, good chance they're going to buy what goes with you. Thank you so much, Alan. I'm already teaching my friends backstage how to do the hard hello. Our next expert is the world-renowned Alta Creativity speaker who has inspired tens of thousands of people to start a new life. She is the former director of marketing at BMW Asia and currently a thought leader in creativity and unleashing potential, a founder and CEO of multi-award winning company Zonenkind. Please welcome Sonia Piantek. Ultra creativity. I'm going to talk today about the mindset and the tools to unleash your full potential and excel even during challenging and difficult times. My name is Sonja Piontek. I've had quite some success in my life, but I've also had some real challenges. And I will share with you today openly what helped me get to the top, but also the tools and the mindset that helped me get back up again when I fell and when I struggled. So let's get going. As you see in this photo, I've had quite the career. I came to um, Singapore six years ago as the director of marketing for BMW Asia. So I was basically working for one of the most prestigious brands in a very dynamic and diverse region, working with the most incredible people. I had a ball. It was fantastic. And I was really doing what I loved doing most. And then one day, my boss calls me into his office and, sorry, without any emotion says, Sonia, we need you at headquarters in Munich. You're going back. My world basically fell apart. 
I just couldn't believe it. So I was standing there going like, well, hang on, hang on, hang on. This is, this is not what I had planned. I just so love it here. I really want to stay here. I've got so many more ideas and plans. But their plan was different. The idea was to send me back to headquarters. So there I was. What was I going to do? And I thought, you know what? If I really want to unleash my potential, this is the time to leave the corporate world and set up on my own. How did I do this? Well, the first thing I want to tell you and I want to share with you, the first tool of ultra creativity is always focus on your strengths. Before you do so, you actually have to know your strengths. You have to know what is it that I'm good at? What is it that I'm passionate about? And then just fully focus on those. There is no need to constantly say, oh, I'm not good at this. I need to improve here. I need to improve there. Fully focus on your strengths. I was well aware of my strengths and I thought, well, with a strategic mindset, my communication skills, my, my way of just making things happen. I can set up a business. I have zero entrepreneurial background, but I, thought, I knew that I could do it. So I said, okay, I know my strengths. And then I started telling my family about it, my friends. And everyone said, no, 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 you cannot leave BMW. And that's one thing, like, there was so much negativity around me. And I'm like, hang on, what do you mean I cannot leave BMW in such a great executive position? Of course I can. Throughout my career, I've always had that attitude of exchange the word cannot into how. How can we make it happen? So whenever people approached me with, oh, no, we can't do this, I would always say, you know what, let's totally ban the word cannot. Let's just think, how can we make it happen? And we've made some pretty cool things happen. Like, as you see on that slide, this is a private photo shooting that we arranged with BMW cars, our VIP customers, in the restricted area of Changi Airport for the first time ever. No one thought it was possible. Well, we made it happen. Then, so I knew my strength. I had totally banned the word cannot from my vocabulary. The third tool for ultra creativity to really unleash your potential is trust yourself. You've got to believe in yourself. And sometimes in life, you might get to a point where you are the only one believing that you can make things happen. But you are the one that can. So if you believe in yourself, if you know that you've got the strength, the passion, then just say to yourself, yes, I can do this. I trust myself. And then the next thing is a very important step. You actually have to go and take that very first step outside the comfort zone. And this step is often not easy. And I can tell you, for me, leaving the corporate world, leaving that executive dream career was quite challenging. I had sleepless nights. I had doubt. I had hesitation. But I always ask myself one question. What is the worst thing that can possibly go wrong? And in most cases, you will realize the worst thing isn't all that bad. I mean, I wasn't going to starve. I wasn't going to lose my life. I wasn't going to lose any of my friends or my family. So I thought, you know what, the worst thing that could possibly happen, a scratch in my ego. And that's survivable. And then I realized another thing, and I really want to share that with you. Beyond the comfort zone lies a universe of opportunities. It is yours to conquer and yours to explore, but you've got to make that one big step outside the, your comfort zone. And once you've made that step, you've got to be determined. And the photo you're seeing now is an image that my good friend Louis Pugh took in the Arctic Ocean. He is doing a long distance swim in the Arctic Ocean. The water is minus 1.7 degrees Celsius cold, below the freezing point because there's so much salt in the water. He is swimming for an unthinkable 20 minutes, nothing but agony and pain. Why would he do that? Lewis has one mission. He wants to save the world's oceans. And he does an extremely good job. How does he do it? Well, that's the big question. Like, how can someone basically survive the unthinkable, go through so much pain and still have the guts to pull on and yet another stroke and another stroke? 
I recently asked him during a dinner, I'm like, Louis, how do you do it? And he just looked me in the eyes and he said, Sonia, there is nothing more powerful than a made up mind. Let me repeat this. There's nothing more powerful than a made up mind. So whenever I struggle in my life, I think of Lewis and how his determination gets him to go through what he does. And it is a really good motivation for me to keep going. So where was I after I left BMW? I set up my dream company. I set up the company, the agency Sonnenkind, and we are known to create unforgettable travel-related experiences for brands like Leica Camera, Land Rover, Lamborghini. And we do it in the most beautiful places of this planet. We've won awards. We've, we've basically created such an amazing business from nothing. And parallel to this, within the, I mean, this has only been two and a half years. Parallel to this, I was able to develop a global speaking career. And this was just because a door opened. And again, I stepped through. There was an opportunity. I got invited to speak on several stages and I thought, wow, this is really enjoyable. And I seem to be quite good at it. The feedback I got was really positive. So I thought, well, let me turn this into a profession. And Within, within a few months, I got bookings from all over the world. I even spoke in the Allianz Arena, like the big soccer stadium of my hometown. I've spoken all over the planet. So it was just going well. And basically what you can see is the press loved what I was doing. And it's not just because I did it well. It's because I really focused on my strengths. I did what I, I was good at and I did what I was passionate about. And this is how you can make magic happen. The press loved it. It was going up and up and up and up. And then 2020 hit. And it hit with brutal force. On a personal level, on a business level, I lost more than I could have ever imagined possible. And I was at a point where there were moments where I had little hope left. I was devastated. There were tears after tears after tears. I lost a child. I lost the love of my life. And both my businesses came to a total, complete standstill. So how did I get out of this deep, deep valley, the valley of tears. Again, I used the tools that I had learned over the years and that had already brought me to success several times before. And then I learned a few other things. And if 2020 has taught me one thing, it is ask for help. Show vulnerability, be honest and open, and do ask your friends, your family, your partners, your business partners, do ask them for help. And you will see, for me, it was the most beautiful thing to realize that people were so happy to be there for me. The strong person who'd always just been there for them and everything was, yeah, I've got a solution. This is easy. We can do this. We can make this happen. All of a sudden, I showed that I also sometimes need a hand that holds me, someone to give me a hug. This was an extremely powerful learning. The next thing that 2020 has really taught me to be even more flexible and more agile than I'd ever been. And this is something that has created the most incredible opportunities for me. This mental agility and just that matter of let's make things happen. And sometimes things aren't perfect. You just got to do them during a time like now. You've just got to go for it. I'm currently in Namibia on a let's end 2020 on a positive note tour. Photographer friend and, my, and me, we've decided to go on a two girls in a four by four on a bucket list tour through Namibia. As we were in Frankfurt airport two nights ago, I got a phone call from a lovely lady called Anna and she's like, Sonia, we really want you to speak at our conference. And I'm like, wow, I'm really honored and I would love to do it. We've got a bit of a challenge. I'm about to board the plane to Namibia and I'm going to be in Namibia for the next few weeks. And she's like, well, the recording would have to be done within the next two, three days. And I'm like, well, 
can we somehow make it happen? And here I am in the lodge in near Windhoek. We're doing the recording with a team that only learned about this job yesterday. But this is what 2020 is all about. Seize opportunities, just make things happen. And one last thing I want to share with you. As you see on that last picture, that is me yesterday enjoying a safari ride on horseback through the bush. You do have to recharge. There's only so much you can do. You need to have times where you actually unwind and recharge. And with these words, I actually want to leave you and say all the very best. Use your mindset, use your creativity and just unleash your potential and make things happen. It is possible. Soar because you can. This is Sonia Piontek, live from Okapuka in Namibia. Thank you very much. Sonia, this was truly beautiful. You are an incredibly strong and inspiring human. Let's keep going. There's so much more to explore. As an educator, I'm happy that big corporations have now turned to new education and soft skills. With most governments being way too slow in innovative education, I believe that businesses can actually take the lead now and change the status quo. Our next speaker is in charge of human potential development programs for over 270,000 people in Russia and worldwide. As a result of her work, Rosatom has been recognized as one of the best employers in Russian and international ratings. Please welcome the Deputy General Director of Rosatom Corporation, Tatiana Tirentiva. Hello everyone. Thank you for having me on this session. There is no doubt that the digital revolution brings lots of opportunities to nuclear industry, but there is a skills gap which is a key challenge to innovation and economic growth. We recently conducted a global research in cooperation with BCG and World Skills International. We discovered that over 50% of employers have recruitment challenges and just cannot find talents with the required competencies. These needed talents often exist somewhere else, perhaps in another industry or geography, and every second out of five employees, which makes 1.3 billion people, have qualifications which do not meet those generally required for the particular job. In some cases, they are over or underqualified. In some, they have skills which became obsolete. Why does it happen? There are two reasons for this. The first one, we live in a world with a high pace of change where a whole technology cycle can change within two to three years. New technologies and new business models create a demand for more and more new talent, regular reskilling and upskilling programs. At the same time, traditional education system cannot supply up-to-date training to all those who need it. The second one, we also live in a world with the increasing complexity of processes which results in the new jobs and new requirements to skills portfolio. Despite of completely different economic and social context, we continue to develop talents the same way as we did in the 20th century. Standard education, one education and one job for life. This concept cannot work today. The few months of the COVID pandemic proved the lack of necessary skills is seen as a barrier not only to productivity growth and innovation, but also to overcoming the COVID crisis. It means that in the order for any corporation to grow, there needs to be a concentration of future-ready talents in the company. Future ready means for me that our employees have a combination of hard and soft skills, which makes them multi potential and highly adaptive throughout their entire professional life. I would like to quote Mr. 
Yuval Harari in this context. In his book, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, he highlights that schools should downplay technical skills and emphasize life skills like adaptability, renovation, and resilience. This means that to be successful in the future, we need the ability to deal with change, to learn new things, and to preserve our mental balance in unfamiliar situations. The concept of 5C, communication, critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, compassion, is what we are applying in our education activities. As workflows become more automated, the demand for soft skills grows. You know that in Russia, we are quite lucky to have a traditionally strong background in engineering disciplines, math and physics. The rising value of the future readiness strengthens the demand for T-shaped talent, professionals with the thorough knowledge of a particular area, but also capable of working in related fields, in addition to having programming or design as the main skill such people can solve problems, build communications, think creatively, etc. Having T-shaped professionals on the payroll promotes communication and collaboration between individual employees and their teams. Our analysis of COVID situation found that teams comprising people with strong and agile skills were the most productive. My addition to 5C concept would be another skills category, self-skills or self-management skills, which compromises the self-development skills or a culture of self-care located in between hard and soft skills. Self-skills include the ability to organize oneself, set goals and focus on achieving them time management, self-motivation and stress management. Demand for soft skills and self-skills has been growing all over the world over the, pa the past few years, but the education system is not yet up to adequately meeting it. School teachers are focused on subject-specific knowledge, living in responsibility for teaching soft skills to the family. Universities are predominantly focused on building professional skills. That is why soft skills programs are top free, most popular product in all MOOC platforms. That is why our role is to help all 260,000 our employees to boost their capabilities to address current and future business needs. We believe that constant reskilling and upskilling are required in the modern workplace, and we are creating an environment of continuous learning. We deliver learning with a wide range of tools, starting from traditional trainings to mentorship programs, corporate skills competitions, think tanks, team alignment and strategy sessions, and different types of facilitation and networking events. Just in the period of COVID pandemic, we organized over 2,500 events and education courses for about 50,000 of our employees, covering digital skills, stress management, digital communication, and others. Rosatom is experiencing an unprecedented phase of global growth and having the right people with the right skills is vitally important. Our mission is to ensure that every Rosatom employee is able to adapt to challenges and that its training is always in place to future-proof existing employees. One of five Rosatom's priorities in the Vision 2030 is to become best in unlocking talent, unlocking potential of our employees. And this ambitious goal is what drives me personally and my team to constantly learn and to look for new knowledge and best practices all over the world. I'm really excited to hear all my peers in this panel. They are a real source of inspiration for millions, for those who learn and for those who create learning environments. I'm happy to be a part of this sharing community. Tatiana, wonderful thoughts. Thank you. I can't agree more that self-management skills are becoming so important in the world where we get more and more information so much that it becomes overwhelming. 
I can't wait to discuss with you the best tools and practices in more detail. It is time to introduce our next speaker. Cohen Timmers is a Belgian educator, author, speaker, and 2017 and 2018 Global Teacher Prize finalist. In 2015, he launched the Kakuma project involving 175 global educators offering free education to African refugees via Skype. His climate action project was supported by His Holiness the Dalai Lama, UNESCO, Greenpeace, and others. Cohen created several educational apps and websites and founded his own online school, currently having 20,000 online students. Cohen will talk about yet another C, critical thinking. Welcome, Cohen. There's no vaccine for climate change. Hi, my name is Kun Timmers and I've been teaching for 20 years. I'm from Belgium and I launched several global educational projects. And due to COVID, I had to use technology in a very different way in order to do my job, as many people had to do on a global scale. And tech comes with benefits and drawbacks. Spam, viruses, cyberbullying, fake news are some of those disadvantages. And fake news has been there for ages, for centuries, and sometimes it's hard to sort facts and figures, gossip, inaccurate news, facts put in, in the wrong context and which are time sensitive or just lies, fake news is a threat to society. Two interesting cases though. A recent movie which is called The Irishman is using a very new technique which is called digital makeup. This technique allows to make its actors Robert De Niro and Al Pacino uh, both aged 77 and 80. This technique allows them to make them 40 years younger. It's impressive, but it can also be used to add very different faces uh, to people and even create fake news. And social media have been creating like Facebook has algorithms with, which unite people which are liking the same kind of contact. And this creates echo chambers where people gather with the same ideas, which can stimulate racism and increase polarization. Is there a vaccine for fake news? Yes, it's called critical thinking. I believe education is key to solve a lot of global issues, but education requires a shift with the right balance between knowledge and skills. And for this, teachers need to change roles too. From sage on the stage to guide on the side, they need to become mentors while their learners are being confronted with really, truly important skills like creativity, collaboration, communication, empathy or compassion and critical thinking. Also known as the 21st century skills or the five C's. Tony Wagner, who was concerned about the huge gap between getting a degree and finding a job, he wrote a book about the seven survival skills for careers, college and citizenship in the 21st century. But in the end, he's talking about the same skills. Students can do more than memorizing definitions about climate change. They have the potential to find solutions and come up with meaningful actions which can change the world. We are using technology to spread ideas across the world with webinars and conferences like this one. So why not allowing students to unite themselves on a global scale to do the same? And that's exactly what I did last month with two and a half million students across 137 countries who are exploring, discussing, brainstorming and sharing their findings and solutions online. Students at intercultural exchanges. We set up video calls between students from Palestine and Israel, Northern Ireland and Ireland, India and Pakistan. Nations which have been in conflict for decades, but after the call we noticed that the students began to appreciate each other. They reflected that it gave them new insights. Insights which may have been troubled by media, public figures, public opinion, social media, etc. Students learned to come up with their own facts and figures which were not biased. 
These students are from Sierra Leone and they really struggle to join the project as they only have internet connection for on Sunday. Due to mud flows, two of these students died during the project, but still they were able to explain how climate change affects their country. And we all learned that climate change can be very different in very different parts of the world. And climate change is a hoax? I don't think so. This is how we brought empathy in our classrooms. How about students 3D printing coral reefs, creating their own editable water bubbles and bioplastic from milk and vinegar, discovering that mealworms can eat plastics without becoming ill? Canadian students aged 14 did all of this. Pretty impressive, right? Thing is, these bioplastics will not replace the plastics they'll be using in daily life, but it changed their mindset and will change, continue changing how they behave at school, at home and in society. And they will know better than those silly articles they read on social media. These students in Alabama invented a solar suitcase. This was shipped to an African refugee camp and the suitcase now gives free power supply to one school. A solution to a real world problem. Not all American states are really keen on teaching about climate change. Why is that? Still, this was a very powerful way to do it. And this teacher, Tara, she discovered that her students be basically believe everything what's on the internet. She decided to dedicate the project on critical thinking and she wrote a Brock article about it. Avoiding climate change is better and a cheaper option than cleaning up or mitigating its impacts. And I really think it may work for fake news too. Let's make sure to ask students to check their resources because this may be a vaccine for both climate change and fake news. Thank you, Cohen. These educators are so inspiring. I believe that teachers will be new celebrities in the 21st century. By the way, Cohen is a co-author of the book Teaching in the Fourth Industrial Revolution, which is available at Amazon. Are you guys ready for more? If you're sitting, I recommend that you get up and stretch a little, uh, maybe do a little robot moves like this. <laughs> Our next speaker is a community builder and an event organizer that works with leaders and entrepreneurs in St. Petersburg and San Francisco. Dmitry Falaleev has also worked as an editor-in-chief and the director of development at Harvard Business Review magazine. What's even more interesting for us is that Dmitry is the founder of U Skills project that teaches soft skills to entrepreneurs. Let's ask Dmitry a few questions. Dmitry, what is the most impactful and popular skill among U Skills community members? Currently, uh, soft skills are becoming ever more important. Uh, there have been a lot of articles about that. What we see in our community joined by people who are already young leaders or will be in a few years' time. So the biggest interest is towards skills uh, related to empathy and all forms of um, communication. And that could be communication in personal life, uh, communication in family, or communication with uh, their colleagues and co-workers. And I believe this is very symbolic and that uh, it is um, a good thing. This is something that not just in our country, but elsewhere in the world, that was a little bit overlooked by the uh, management theory. So we uh, have uh, quite a lot of initiatives to invite people who can explain about empathy and what it is and why it's important, how to talk to mentors or to co-workers. 
to uh, contribute to the advancement of uh, which of the together. skills listed in the title of the session communication critical thinking creativity collaboration compassion seem the most relevant to you personally if I was asked which of the four skills is the most important it would be difficult to choose. After all, all of them are important. Previously, I spoke about communication spill skills being uh, in demand at the moment. I would um, uh, single out critical thinking because um, it is um, something to be uh, developed. Um, it doesn't get uh, perhaps uh, enough attention. However, it's very important in terms of an individual's uh, leadership or personal skills. And this is something that hasn't been taught at schools and universities and uh, is not taught to these days. I, um, I want to be mistaken, but I guess that's the most uh, How to bring entrepreneurial skills skill to the me. corporate environment. I know that you skills does it. There is no uh, single agreement in terms of whether entrepreneurship can be taught or what it is, what it consists of. And then again, it evolves. Uh, entrepreneurship of today is different from entrepreneurship uh, as it existed 20 years ago. I guess uh, certain skills can be taught. What is difficult to teach is uh, the mindset. I guess that each of us may have um, some inborn share of uh, this entrepreneurial skill. You can really develop that, but becoming an entrepreneur, if you don't have the gift, uh, would be quite challenging. It's similar to arts. We know the names of great entrepreneurs of the past and, and present. Uh, everybody knows the names such as Steve Jobs or Elon Musk. So I would say that uh, teaching this thinking is uh, difficult, if not impossible if the person uh, doesn't have uh, that potential. Individual skills can be taught and there are some accelerators or incubators. I guess uh, things such as risk appetite or risk tolerance or make money with uh, some unusual ways. Uh, developing new models, uh, finding so-called blue oceans. I guess uh, that is possible. So I guess some of that can be taught, and it's a long journey. And uh, I guess that some of the individuals who are being taught will never become entrepreneurs, but they will be able to find themselves uh, in a corporation in uh, one capacity or another. I guess this is an area that uh, would certainly be useful How to study. How is the study. pandemic changing the demands of entrepreneurs and members of your community? Um, interestingly, this whole pandemic and process acceleration makes people um, think in a more entrepreneurial way. Many find it hard um, and it's uh, quite normal, but what the pandemic has demonstrated is that we had to operate in environments of uncertainty. Not everyone was prepared to that, but uh, we pretty much didn't have any choice. Uh, and this is something that uh, an entrepreneur com comes across all the time. So the ability to influence uh, your own psychology, to be able to withstand stress and pressure, people don't like it. Uh, and it's no secret that most of entrepreneurs don't like it. Uh, it's uh, a bit of a situation beyond the normal. So I guess uh, entrepreneurs uh, would uh, take the pandemic um, a little bit easier, but for everyone else uh, that's some sort of a training, even if it's not something that they don't want. I mean a training in entrepreneurial skills and the mindset in terms of risk tolerance. Yet to this day we don't have a choice. Uh, we'll operate in this environment uh, some say it's six months or maybe even further when we already have the vaccine. 
So I wish uh, everyone to be able to accept and embrace, to operate in an environment of stress and risk, to um, be able to communicate with people, to manage yourselves. So yes, it's an entrepreneurial situation that we operate in. What else changed in people and myself, I guess, is uh, uh, it's a good exercise in accepting and embracing. And uh, I don't support the idea that a crisis is an opportunity. I don't believe the current crisis is an opportunity. I'm not a scholar. I'm not an economist or a sociologist. But my inner feeling is a bit different uh, from previous crises. I don't see any direct uh, opportunity. I believe for many this is a crisis that uh, better wouldn't have existed. But if we were to look for at least uh, some advantages in the current situation, I would um, describe it as, uh, as I said, an exercise in uh, acceptance and embracing an opportunity to spend some time with yourself, to rethink something, to become calmer, to let go of the rat race, even uh, as uh, uh, this uh, has now been around for some time and people calm down a bit. Certainly for myself, I try to um, embrace the circumstances that I have no control of and to accept myself in those circumstances. And this is at least something that you have control over. I mean, what's happening inside of ourselves. And uh, it's an opportunity to learn, even not take courses or read books, but just to be with, you, with uh, yourselves and reflect. I guess that for many, this has become an opportunity to become, if not better, but at least to know uh, oneself better. Thank you for the opportunity to address such a big audience, uh, to share a lot of ideas that I believe are really important. And I hope that uh, I made uh, some of the people think and uh, uh, helped them advance in their reflection about what's going on around us at the moment. I believe that uh, certain mindsets and skills have to be changed. Thank you. Thank you, Dmitry. I'm thrilled to announce our next speaker, Troy Malone. Troy is a Silicon Valley executive that is passionate about languages and education. He was a general manager of the Asia Pacific region for Evernote, responsible for growing the user base in nine different countries and organizing the company's infrastructure in Southeast Asia, South Korea, and India. Troy helped to grow Evernote from 10 to 200 million users. Now together with Phil Libin, founder of Evernote, Troy is working on a wonderful product called Mm-hmm that has just raised $31 million from Sequoia. With his unique international growth experience, Troy will share his insights on collaboration. Hello and welcome. My name is Troy Malone and I'm very excited to be speaking with you today at the Global Impact Conference. You know, with COVID going on and us not being able to physically meet together, I'm so thankful for the technologies that allow us to come together in a virtual environment like this and still share our ideas and hopefully progress as humans together. So it's great to meet with you. And uh, let me give you a little background about myself. Uh, I have worked at companies in Silicon Valley, some of which are Evernote. Uh, I also was the vice president of international expansion at Weebly, which sold to Square, the payments processing uh, uh, platform. And most recently, I'm at a company called mm -hmm, which is actually the technology that's allowing me to present kind of the slides here like this for you and be able to put on this virtual presentation, hopefully in a compelling way. And what I'm going to talk with you today about is one of the C's, collaboration and why collaboration is so important. So I've, I've put together a simplified definition of what collaboration is. 
working together. It could be working together with another person, working together between organizations to create mutually exciting outcomes. And the reason that I chose exciting is collaboration only works when both sides are excited about the outcome and really believe that the outcome is worth pushing toward and working toward together. So collaboration, in my estimate, the way to have successful collaboration between people or organizations is really to make sure that you have a compelling, exciting case for the outcome. And that's something that I've tried to do over the course of my career. I've negotiated many partnerships with uh, different companies around the world. And really, it all boiled down to making sure that we had a compelling, unified vision of what the outcome was going to be. And in all those cases, when we did have aligned vision on the outcome, the uh, results were simply amazing. And uh, I want to tell you about one experience right now where I collaborated with an individual in Korea named Mr. Hong. This is Mr. Hong here. Uh, Mr. Hong is my best friend in Korea. He does not speak a lick of English. I do speak Korean, but I speak, you know, kind of uh, eight-year-old boy Korean, not uh, really absolutely 100% fluent. So he and I uh, only speak in Korean. He speaks, uh, and he, he never, like, speaks low to me. He always speaks as if I was a Korean, which is very very challenging, but we have a great time together and always love connecting and sharing our ideas. So to give you the background on Mr. Hong, when I first started with Evernote, I had no connections in Asia, but yet my charge was to figure out how to expand into Asia. So what I did is I went to Twitter and in Korean characters, I spelled out Evernote, Ebonotu and put that into the Twitter search bar so that I could filter all the tweets in Korea who was talking about Evernote. And Mr. Hong here came up as a clear person who really liked the product and was actually including a few chapters in each of his technology books, he's an author, uh, about Evernote. So I connected with him and uh, told him I was coming to Korea and I asked him if he wanted to, again, collaborate on putting together a user meetup in Korea when I went. Sure enough, he organized it and we put it together and we got 40 people in the room. Now, when I was leaving Korea after this meetup, I was thinking it was a tremendous success and I asked Mr. Hong, hey, next time I come to Korea, can we do another meetup? And he looked me in the eye and he kind of got this, you know, smile on his face and he said, meetup, why don't we try a conference? And he kind of smiled at me and I was, it, it blew my mind. And that's one thing I want to tell you guys about collaboration. Collaboration can open up your mind to new possibilities that you just didn't bring to the table initially. And this was the case for me. I didn't have that vision of putting on an actual conference for Evernote. We were so early in our development, but because Mr. Hong opened my mind, we collaborated on that and put together a conference that had 2000 people attend in South Korea. And frankly, after that conference in Korea, we started doing conferences around the globe that were just as successful all because of the collaboration that I did with Mr. Hong and him helping me open my mind. Now, a lot of people who know me and Mr. Hong always would think, oh, well, Evernote is paying Mr. Hong to do what he's doing. We didn't pay him anything. And, uh, but what I did do is I made sure that he was able to make good, a good living writing books about Evernote as well as putting on seminars and trainings about Evernote. So he was able to create a great career based on Evernote, but we didn't even have to uh, bring him on as an employee or do anything formally. It's because we were aligned in our vision and we were both mutually excited about what we thought we could do for Evernote starting in Korea and it ended up impacting the world. So collaboration is an amazing thing. Now, 
I want to tell you about another type of collaboration. Oh, by the way, this is uh, the mayor of Seoul, Korea and Mr. Hong. The mayor of Seoul, Korea saw how much success we were having in Korea and actually said on TV that he needed to get trained on it. So Mr. Hong actually reached out and uh, trained the mayor of Seoul, Korea how to use Evernote better. So that again just shows the success that you can have when you collaborate with the right people that have the correct visions aligned. Okay, so next type of collaboration I wanna talk about is uh, uh, the situation where you may think it is competitive, but it truly isn't. So I wanna talk about Elon Musk and why he created Tesla and some of the companies that he's created. This is what an electric car has always been. Kind of funny looking, not the type of car that uh, frankly you would be able to get a date in. <laughs> um, not an impressive car by any means. Is it efficient? Yes. But does it look kind of dorky? Yes. Uh, that's the way these things have always been. And Elon Musk, his end goal is to bring about a fundamental change in how we think about automobiles. And he knew the way to do that was to change the perception of what an electric car is and could be. And he, of course, we all know he created Tesla to do that. So now suddenly electric cars are a status symbol. It's something people aspire to. They want to have this. They want to be seen in this. And they want to share with their friends all the cool technological features that you can show off with a Tesla. So this is Elon Musk collaborating with the broader environment. Again, opening their minds to what's possible but also creating healthy competition, knowing that the competitors would have to improve drastically in order to compete and be and make this market. So that's what happened. If you look at Chevy, this is actually a great looking car and it never would have existed unless Tesla came along and proved out that you could lower battery prices and that you could actually create an attractive electric vehicle. And of course, Musk didn't leave it at that. Musk has the goal of making humans into an interplanetary species, which is one of the biggest goals I could ever imagine coming up with. But yet that is his goal. And how is he doing that? He's challenging NASA. He's challenging the Russians and their space program, the Chinese and their space program. He's doing reusable rockets, introducing new technologies, again with the end goal that the other space agencies will take this technology and progress with it. And one thing I forget to mention, uh, speaking about collaboration, is that Elon Musk made his battery technologies all open source to the whole, whole world so that other companies could benefit from the technologies that Tesla was producing, again, because the end goal and vision is not to be the, the only winner in the marketplace, but to be a leader that brings the others along in a collaborative fashion. So collaboration can happen in a myriad of ways. I hope that this has been helpful to you in thinking through how you can come up with compelling ideas that are exciting enough to get people and organizations aligned with you to execute and produce an amazing outcome. It's been great talking with you. Hope you have a great rest of the conference and think about how you can collaborate with others. Bye. Troy, thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, I think it was really insightful and inspiring. When it comes to critical thinking, that, that's kind of something that I think is worth talking a little bit about and in the context of tools. Because this is something that I learned personally from Phil Libin, former founder and, and CEO of Evernote, and now whom I'm working with at mm -hmm. uh, uh -huh. One of his amazing talents, and I think, you know, Elon Musk is very much like this, but thinking from first principles, like I'm always amazed at working with someone who's absolutely so brilliant whenever we go into a situation talking about a complex business problem or something like that, he never takes shortcuts. And this is something that I've learned to do as well, to not take shortcuts in thought. 
we're hu humans, so we learn from experience and we bake in a lot of assumptions based on our experience. And a lot of times those, those assumptions, especially in a fast moving technology world are wrong. Uh, we don't realize it, but they are. And so from a tools perspective, when it comes to critical thinking, to question everything. I can't tell you how often I'm in a meeting with Phil and I'll kind of say something as though it's true and he'll have, have the forethought to really question it and say, but is that really true now? Is that still true, right? And I think being in this world, uh, at least in technology, which is the industry that I'm in, the ability to test our assumptions is now so easy and so readily available to us that the downside to making assumptions is absolutely huge in technology. And the upside to questioning everything and getting to first principles, there's huge upside to that. So, but it's a different way of thinking. Us as humans, we always wanna take a shortcut in thinking. Oh, I've seen this before, this is how it works. Therefore, this is what we need to do, as opposed to stepping back and saying, is this still how it works? And is this assumption, assumption still valid? If you're questioning it, let's test it and let the market tell us, right? So I think that's a huge tool is thinking from first principles and always being willing to question your own assumptions and your own biases that you bring to the table. I think that's an important concept, an important tool that we need to learn going forward because a lot of us assume that that red button is gonna be the best button on that page, but why not test the red against the blue and let the market tell us truly what is the best button for that page from a performance perspective. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, you know, that makes total sense. And uh, we are talking about five C's here. And uh, it's not that all skills of the future have to start with a C. But I <laughs> right. totally thought as I was listening, to you, I totally thought of curiosity, you know, I'm like, this is what <laughs> is talking about, like, be and this is what you're uh, like, uh, Phil seems to be doing. He's like, curious, like, is that so? And how does it really right. work? Let me let me uh, not take it for granted, but actually let me go and explore it and, and yeah. uh, examine it and maybe uh, try it in a different way. So curiosity, yeah. I think it's a big one. Yeah, and, and I think that's exactly how mm -hmm, happened. This technology we're using right here, that's exactly how it happened is it was intellectual curiosity on, can we make this better? If we were to rethink the experience that we're having on Zoom calls, is there a way to make it a little bit better and improve on that experience and put more of the creative power into people's hands? Um, yeah. That's kind of a, a big premise and something to experiment with. And that's exactly what he did. He experimented with one of our engineers and then they got it to a point where people were looking at it and saying, wow, that's, that's different. What have you done here? How are you doing that, right? And, and that's how I think great new technologies are brought to market is that curiosity factor. And, and frankly, the willingness to be able to explore in the face of uncertainty. Because, yeah. you know, when you look back on something and you say, well, of course, mm -hmm, should have been made, right? Or of course, the Tesla should have been made. But at the point when people are actually rethinking those technologies and rethinking, should I actually bring this to market? It's very uncertain. So, so the willingness to have curiosity and explore and, and fail along the way until you kind of get something that works or until you get something that doesn't work, let's not forget about that option. Um, yeah. But yeah, like that I think is a huge skill set for people to to uh, be exploring and working with and, and getting um, excited about. And, and I, I would suggest, I mean, this is just kind of me personally, but one of the things I love doing is I work in technology, so it's all virtual in a way, but I like working with my hands as well as a hobby, um, which helps me explore different avenues and try to create new things physically in the physical world 
But that also stimulates that part of your brain. How can I make this physical object better? How can I make it perform better? How can I make it, uh, uh, you, you know, kind of match more what I want it to do, right? And I think that doing that in the physical world is just as important as doing it in the virtual world and, and kind of like coming with, you know, the technologies that we're all familiar with today on our computers. So, yeah, I think doing things in the physical world is also very important to stimulate that part of our brain uh, into being more creative. At least that's what I yeah. found personally. That's what I like to do, you know. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And when we, you know, again, even when we're learning things, I, I love it. For example, Queen's Gambit, you know, there's this uh, TV show that made the whole world play chess. And now uh, playing yeah. chess every evening, I find so many ideas and inspiration and then I go and go to masterclass.com and I watch Gary Kasparov's masterclass on playing chess. Yeah. And again, in everything, like all the uh, strategies and ideas and thoughts, I, I find so much inspiration to the business and to uh, education. So I think not staying in our bubble, but going yeah. out and exploring uh, whatever it is. If you are too much in the digital, go do physical. If you go to too much in the physical, like go and do digital and uh, right. so on and so forth, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I agree. That's really cool that you got into chess based on that uh, on that show. My wife was watching that the other day and I was like, oh, wow, this is really cool. It's um, incredible. Yeah, it, it's very <laughs> incredible. And, and I like what you're saying. You, you're exactly right. That's a game, but it's all about strategy and a way of thinking. It's, it's kind of creating new neural pathways in your brain of how to think about things. And I think one of, one of the things that we get, uh, this whole shortcut concept and how we, we create shortcuts, our mind does in our daily life. Like you probably haven't thought about how you, you brush your teeth lately or uh, get ready in the morning for your day. But it's kind of fun sometimes to step back and rethink your whole life. Like sometimes what I do is I'll look at my office setup and I'll be like, if, if I were to walk in this room for the first time, what would I want to change? And suddenly you start seeing opportunities for improvement in just the setup of your office. And, and that you can take as a way of thinking and a way of operating is your business, right? Like if you were to start, if you were to walk into this business day one as a consultant, what is glaringly obvious that you would say, why are you doing that? <laughs> like, why are you still doing it this way versus that way, right? Um, I think that's a, also a helpful way to, to look at things. And like you said, you know, learning chess or learning some sort of a new skill that requires your mind to kind of get creative and think through things uh, this whole creative thinking concept, uh, it, it's a muscle and, and it's something that you can definitely develop and uh, your mind will love you for it because I think our <laughs> minds thrive on learning and processing new things, right? So, yeah. That's very yeah. cool. Wow, your mind will love you for it. I think this should be a tagline of uh, our... <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Exactly. Your mind will love you for it. That's true. <laughs> okay, Troy, that's uh, with you. It's always we can talk forever. And there's so many ideas and it's so inspiring. So thank you so much for your presentation and for taking time to uh, to talk. Um, and I mean, let's keep doing this. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I, I, I enjoyed it as well. And thank you for the invite. It was I was happy to to speak at this conference and, and to uh, uh, explore some ideas with you. So thanks for that opportunity. OK, <laughs> see, you. <laughs> see you. I want to start my talk with a short story. It will help us to better understand why now is the right time to develop skills of the future. If human history is a 1,000 centuries, 100,000 years, picture there's a 500 pages book that's telling the story. Every page is two centuries. And imagine you are an alien trying to understand human history. The first 450 pages, the first 90,000 years is just hunter-gatherers. That's it. There are migrations and hunter-gatherers and very slight changes. As an alien, you are super bored reading this book. 
then page 450 you have the agricultural revolution and you have cities this is a huge step and then last 50 pages of the book things start to develop in a kind of interesting cool way on page 490 you have Jesus think about it AD just started 10 pages ago on page 498 you'll have the enlightenment and right at the beginning of page 500 you have the industrial revolution and the progress goes on steroids the population balloons from 1 billion to 7 billion on page 500 alone on every other page before 500 transportation meant uh, walking running maybe uh, sailboats page 500 we are going to space station we have planes and cars communication on page 499 and earlier meant talking to people and writing letters with your hand page 500 we have zoom and internet so you're an alien reading this book and you are on the page 500 and you just can't believe what's happening you say oh my god this is the story this is what it's all been leading to what about to happen you're about to turn to page 501 and you're just like things are about to happen here and this is where we all were born it's crazy we should understand that it's either going to be an awesome story for humanity or it's just going to be an end 501 page book either page 501 is the new bc or this is the end of the book now my big question is what can we actively do to make sure that this is not 501 page book what skills will allow us to continue on or if you want lack of which skills will make the book end this is how i define the search for skills of the future a lot of people read Yuval Harari and he is great in making us understand the history and our possible future. But if I had a magic wand, I would make every human on earth read Tim Urban's series called The Story of Us. Tim Urban is one of the internet's most popular writers. With fun stick figure illustrations and uh, epic prose and everything from procrastination to artificial intelligence, Urban's blog Wait But Why has millions of fans. In the story of us, Tim creates a new language to help us think better about the way we think. He suggests that in our mind we have two entities, the primitive mind and the higher mind. Primitive mind is like an old software that is only wired to pass over genes at basically any cost. Higher mind is a new creation. This is where we get reason, empathy, and imagination from. At different points, uh, one of minds can take over and can make us do either something very primitive or something that we can be proud of. In my opinion, skills of the future are the ones that help us to spend more of our time in our higher mind and less in our primitive mind. My company is called Elk Academy. L here stands for education plus love equals knowledge. To me, this means that only connecting technology with human empathy, care, and love, we can create new education. When we started to become more than a language school, uh, actually helping people, not just with their language, but with their real life, big goals, I started to search for a new way to identify. A friend of mine told me about the four C's concept and I was happy this was so close to the skills that we were actually teaching. But something was missing. Then we had an insight and added our own fifth C to the famous formula. It was compassion. Here are the definitions of compassion that I like. To have compassion means to empathize with someone who is suffering and to feel compelled to reduce the suffering. It's a fuller, truer definition that feelings than feelings alone. I like this because it's actionable. Every day, using our learning by doing methodology, I iterate and experiment together with our teachers and students to create programs that would create a holistic approach to a new practical education that would teach skills of the future. 
one of the discoveries that I want to share with you so you can maybe start using it as well uh, is the methodology that we call challenges. It took me five years of experiments to come up with all the ins and outs. Uh, you can just take it and use it now. First, we define our goal that we want to achieve in 21 days. It has to be something specific like making your new social media pro profile entirely in English so that you can develop your international personal brand or filling out an application for an accelerator or preparing for a job interview. Then we unite all the people that want to achieve the same goal into groups of 15. We call them tribes. We put them together in Telegram or one of the messengers. Then we launch the challenge. Every day we give people in the tribe some digestible theory. The lesson shouldn't take more than 10-15 minutes. We constantly update our mini lessons uh, to make sure that information is always super relevant. And the most important thing is that every day we give them, um, we give the tribe a challenge, an action that they need to do in order to immediately put this new knowledge into practice. Everyone who completes the challenge gets a badge. You can use a cool service called Notion for that, just like we do. Every week people who get the most badges get little prizes, but most importantly, they feel how they every step they get closer to their goal. We notice that people get incredible results using this methodology. Here's a Zoom call with people that just a week ago started the challenge with no language at all and a language barrier. Just after a week, each of them introduces themselves and tells a short story in English in Zoom in front of 50 people. And the same thing happens with other skills. One week ago, I was invited by a healthcare association in Russia to help them develop challenges to help educate doctors about the new innovative medicine that is available, uh, but doctors just don't have time to get to know it. All ways of informing them just don't work. This is one example how new education can be literally saving lives. So, get together with your friends, find a common goal, and stick to making small steps in order to achieve it in 21 days. And keep each other accountable. If you think about it, you will have all five C's in this practice. Communication about the best strategies, collaboration in doing tasks together, critical thinking to tell what they really works and what doesn't, creative thinking to come up with new tasks and creative solutions. And of course, compassion. Your tribe becomes your family. We see so much love and support in them. Challenge yourself this way and your higher mind will thank you. I think any conference is a great way to discover new people and new ideas but I also think it all means nothing if we don't follow up and don't put the new connections and knowledge into practice. So please reach out to me and other speakers of my panel and let's build a new higher mind world together. Dear viewers, 